Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Julia Kagansky. I'm one of the hosts uh, hosting IMG Forum this year, and it's my privilege to welcome you to today's keynote session and to day two of the IMG Forum here at Mutech. Um, for those of you who were with us yesterday, I hope you enjoyed the programs, and I think you're really in for a treat with this morning's keynote, so thanks for getting up early and getting your coffee and getting here on time. Um, if you were with us yesterday for uh, Douglas Rushkoff's keynote, um, you heard him talk about uh, team human and the importance of finding the others and building a collective enterprise that can, you know, recenter our attention on human needs and human flourishing. And um, today we're going to hear a keynote that broadens and expands and complicates that point of view. Um, we're going to be hearing from Jason Edward Lewis and Suzanne Kite of the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, um, led in conversation by Angela Gabbro. Um, the panel is based on an award-winning essay, and uh, the initiative brings together a multitude of indigenous epistemologies to challenge and critique the anthropocentric point of view that dominates our Western culture and encourages us to prioritize human flourishing above all else. Angela will introduce the speakers in the discussion today. Um, Angela is a Montreal-based software developer and artist who has spent the last 15 years developing enterprise software systems. She's participated in the emergence of the web as a platform, cloud computing, internet of things, and artificial intelligence. As an artist, she has produced several interactive technology-based projects um, and has exhibited in Canada and internationally. She holds a joint degree in computer science and fine arts from C Concordia University and is currently employed at RDNote, a digital health startup providing clinical nutrition decision support tools for hospital systems. Take it away, Angela. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today? Thank you for coming to our talk. I uh, just wanted to start the day with a brief territorial acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that this event is taking place on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyagahaga Nation are rec uh, recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships. Thank you. And I'll begin by presenting Jason Lewis. Uh, Jason Edward Lewis is a digital media poet, artist, and software designer. He is a university research chair in computational media and the indigenous future imaginary, as well as the professor of computation arts at Concordia University. Jason founded OBX Laboratories for Experimental Media at Concordia, where he leads research exploring computation as creative and cultural material. He also directs initiative, the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, an, an international research partnership focused on how indigenous people are imagining and creating futures they want. Jason's creative and creation, no, sorry, Jason's creative and production work has been featured at Ars Electronica, Electra, Mobile Fest, Urban Screens, ICA, Seagraph, and File, among other venues, and has been recognized with an all girl. Robert Coover Award for Best Work of Electronic Literature, two pre-Ars Electronica honorable mentions, several imaginative Best New Media Awards, and six solo exhibitions. Born and raised in Northern California, Lewis is Cherokee, Hawaiian, and Samoan. Welcome, Jason. <laughs> and then beside me we have Kite, AKA Susan Kite who is an Oglala Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer raised in Southern California, with a BFA from CalArts in music composition, and a BFA from Bard's College of Milton Avery Graduate School, and a PH, oh, sorry, sorry, MFA from Bard's College of Milton Avery Graduate School, and is a PhD candidate at Concordia University. Currently, she is a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar and Research Assistant for the Initiative for Indigenous Futures. Recently, Kite has been developing a body interface for movement performances, carbon filter sculptures, immersive video and sound installations, as well as co-running the experimental electronic imprint 
Unheard Records. Welcome, Suzanne. <laughs> so, where shall we begin? A very deep and broad topic. <laughs> but we thought we might begin by talking, um, by just talking about biases built into our, no, we're bias built into our tools. So, AI has been a lot of discussion on, you know, how it's going to impact our workflows and how we use it in day to day, especially here at a festival like this, where many of the people who are presenting or their work and their uh, as artists, um, as well as academics in this conference, are talking about how uh, AI impacts our day to day work and our day to day lives. So we thought we would start by discussing examples of AI in our day to day work or biases that we may encounter in the softwares that we use. So I pass it off to Suzanne. Do you have a a sort of thoughts on biases in the software that you use or how AI impacts a piece of software that you might use. Oh, I see the slides. Should I skip this? Okay. He says, talk about Ableton. <laughs> <laughs> Segway. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we we discussed this at discussed this at length um, in the past weeks or so, and we, uh, you know, as a composer, uh, musician, you know, I started as it's it's kind of interesting working um, with these, you know, I'm I'm working with software because of a need and a desire in composition and artistic and art making, and so coming at it from there, it's um, it's not. Uh, you know, I'm using tools in composition. Initially, when I when I started, whatever I'm doing now, it it started by making using uh, tools that were already made, and and then realizing their um, you know their limits very quickly. Um, and you know, one you know, there's many limits, and we talk about bias, you know, all the way down to code. Um, but initially, what you know, kind of. Uh, alerted me that there were many of these tools. I mean, just looking at the grid in Ableton and um, and realizing that the it's easiest to work in most of these tools um, in a in a gridded way. And then saying, well, why is it in a grid? And then you know, as a musician, you in music school, you're like, why is everything in four four? You know, it's like the classical music is um, is the monster that's holding me down. I'm going to move to electronic music so I can be free, <clears throat> only to find that you know, there's just um, you know, more grids holding down, grids and grids and grids. Um, and then, you know, seeing that those tools are replicated and that logic is replicated all the way, all the way to the core. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's initially, you know, a, lot, like a decade ago when I was like, why is Ableton forcing me to use the quantization? <laughs> So uh, not really about AI, but thinking in terms uh, about a project I'll talk a little bit more about. <clears throat> when So my original art practice is uh, around poetry. Um, and I got to a point where I was really interested in having the text move, having dynamic text, and finding that the tools that were available to me, so Microsoft Word for composing the text, doesn't really do much to help you make the text move or make it interactive. Uh, but then the tools at the time in the 90s when I was doing it that you could use to sort of visualize text in interesting ways, say like Photoshop, and then make it move. So like uh, After Effects um, were really, really crappy uh, text compositional tools. You wouldn't want to actually compose a text in either one of those tools. Uh, and so sort of confronting sort of a very um, kind of rigid mindset about what it is that they expect, what the Microsoft Word designers, what they expect text to do, and what you might want to, you might want to do to it. Um, and then on the other side with the visual graphics tools, also finding like a very sort of like clear box of like, this is what you can do visually with text. Um, it's different now, uh, 20 some odd years later, uh, because people have worked on tools um, to, to sort of kind of bridge that gap and allow you to move back and forth. But for me, that was one of the early sort of moments of really kind of confronting both the power of the tools, each of these tools is very powerful on their own, but then the constraints in the sense of like how they want you to think about the world. So with this constrained sense of the world, uh, you talk about being forced to use certain aspects of Ableton or being forced into a grid. Um, you know, is that a problem or is that a potential? And you know, how did this lead into the work that we're discussing now uh, with AI and uh, machines? So <laughs> for me, the so we'll have sort of different origin stories for this. 
uh, for me, it came out of sort of that work that I was doing, but then also sort of early work when I was doing my undergraduate, uh, looking at uh, looking at how computation was um, sort of computation is an expressive system, uh, and thinking about how computation um, and the use of computational machinery intervened in the communications that we. Uh, that we had with each other and trying to think about what that intervention meant and how it shaped the ways that we, or it was shaping the ways that we were talking to each other, right? Because of course, when I started this, you know, when I really started this, it was before the web even was was present. So it was sort of a different world and you can sort of roll back your, uh, roll back either your memory or your sort of recollection of things that you've seen on the net uh, to imagine that world. So, um, where's the clicker? Here's the clicker. So, as I said, my, my original art practice is around poetry, and what I was interested in doing at the beginning was, uh, particularly when I was at graduate school, was thinking really hard about how can I, how can I um, write and do visual design and do programming all in the same environment, instead of having to go into different environments to do these different aspects, um, or what were considered different aspects of my of my production for the artwork that I was making. And a big part of that is because I was just interested in having a space where I could sketch and sort of ideate and work very quickly at all these levels at the same time. And there just wasn't a tool available to do that. And so what I'm just showing here are um, uh, results of a project that I did in sort of 2010 to 2014 called Poetry for Excitable Mobile Media, um, where I made nine different apps that I think really um, sort of um, in some ways got to that point where I was able to do all three of those things at the same at the same time. So I was really able to focus on the writing and making sure that the text was rich and interesting uh, and focus at the same time on the visualization and thinking about how the visualization supported the text uh, and not sort of seeing that the visualization as something just kind of came afterwards or you put on top of the text. And then also working with my collaborator Bruno Nadeau who was doing most of the programming at that point um, to really think about how to create dynamic behaviors in response to people's interactions that also supported what was going on with the poem. So trying to figure out how to get all these things working together to express the things that I wanted to express. And thinking about poetry and how in poetry we use things like you know, meter and rhyme and different poetic forms to help us express certain kinds of emotions and sort of make certain kind of points and thinking about how um, interactivity, uh, network connectivity, dynamic motion, all the other things that come with us, come up in and are available to use in the digital environment, how I can make use of those in the same way that a poet writing for the page might use layout or might use punctuation to augment what it is that they're trying to say. So um, uh, so this is all, This, is, in some sense, this is a project that was really about trying to break down sort of the, the, the bias towards thinking about text in a particular way that I found in the tools that were available to me and writing new tools to, uh, to express things in the way that I wanted to express them. So uh, the other sort of way, uh, the other thing that was trying to happen at the same time is thinking about bias in the larger sense, um, in the, the sort of societal sense, and thinking about how computational uh, systems embed cultural preferences and cultural values and trying to understand, first of all, how to articulate those because it can be very difficult to see, particularly if you're like me, you're trained in, uh, partially in computer science. Um, and so there's just a bunch of assumptions built into that training that it can be very difficult to see are actually built into that training. Um, but I think just in general, as humans, it's very difficult sometimes to see what our biases are. Um, and uh, sort of thinking about how our computational systems be, are, were becoming one more site in which those biases were being expressed. Um, and uh, starting to do some writing about that and thinking about that and being in dialogue with people about that. Uh, and then sort of later on, so really sort of in the late 2000s and the early 2010s, um, starting to see some really great work uh, by some of the people that you see here, um, ProPublica, Safia Noble, Kathy O'Neill, sort of researchers really going in and looking at how our software systems have encode all sorts of uh, biases, uh, racial bias, gender bias, uh, heteronormativity bias, uh, that, that people who are making them will swear up and down that there's, that they can't, the systems can't be biased, right? It's just an algorithm and it's just crunching data. 
right? And I don't know if they will argue that now. I think finally it's gotten through to them that that's not actually true. But certainly in the early years and certainly when I worked in Silicon Valley, that was almost always the response because none of those people thought that what they were doing had a cultural dimension to it. They were just developing technology. I think that's it for me. Oh, and then, am I going on too much? No, no, please. No, we'll do this yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so fast forward a little bit, and uh, one of my colleagues, Noe Arista, who is a professor of history at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in Honolulu, um, uh, sends, me a, sends me a note and says, hey, there's this really interesting competition going on. Um, that is super problematic now because <laughs> as we just found out last night, as we were all putting the finishing touches on our preparations for day, is it was run by Joey Ito, who's the director of the, the Media Lab. And uh, if you go and Google things afterwards, you will find out that he has now been caught up in the, uh, the Epstein scandal. So um, that's a whole other story, of course. But, uh, yeah. but for the moment, the story I was gonna tell was <laughs> that he wrote an essay called Resisting Reduction, where he was, he was trying to make a sincere effort to talk to his fellow technology developers about um, how they needed to think much more broadly about the computational systems that they were developing, particularly around artificial intelligence. Um, and then he invited responses to that and sort of ran an international competition. And so um, I uh, talked to Noe and then uh, Archer Pachawas, who's a, a media performance artist based in Toronto, who's Cree, um, and Suzanne, about putting together a response. And so we created this essay called Making Kin with the Machines. You know, and uh, the basic idea is, I'll just read it, we believe that indigenous epistemologies are much better at respectfully accommodating the non-human. We retain a sense of community that is not racially defined, but articulated through complex kin networks anchored in specific territories, genealogies, and protocols. Ultimately, our goal is that we, as a species, figure out how to treat these new non-human kin respectfully and reciprocally, and not as tools, slaves to their creators. Um, and so that was um, kind of a moment where we got together and started thinking really focused about how indigenous ways of knowing, so indigenous ways of sort of understanding the world, in particular other entities in the world, might have something to show us or to teach us about how we might start thinking about uh, artificial intelligence and its role in our lives. And in particular, how different indigenous communities might think about it. So there's not one, gene there's not one uh, abstract, generic, indigenous way of looking at things, but there are um, there are Lakota ways of looking at things, Mi'kmaq way of looking at things, Hawaiian way of looking at things. Um, and so how can we sort of use those different ways of encountering the world and understanding the world to understand what these sort of new entities that we're developing might be and how we might relate to them. Um, and just real quickly, we did, you're gonna see some images later, we, um, this winter, we did two workshops where we brought indigenous people, uh, folks from all around the world, so technology developers, uh, uh, culture makers, language experts, et cetera. We brought them together to talk about this problem, right? To talk about what is our response to AI and what kind of AI would we like to see in the world and what is our critique of the present way in which AI is being developed. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about what happened there as we go through the, go through the morning. Um, and just quickly, yeah, the four questions from indigenous perspectives, what should our relationship with AI be? How can indigenous epistemologies and ontologies contribute to the glo global conversation regarding AI and society? How do we broaden discussions regarding the role of technology in society beyond the largely culturally homogenous research labs in Silicon Valley startup culture? And how do we imagine a future with AI that contributes to the flourishing of all humans and non-humans? And now I'm gonna turn it over to Suzanne. Okay, and I'm trying to remember that originally you asked about bias, so I'll try to. <laughs> well, sort of from bias, how, how, where did you lead yeah. to this, uh, the work, thinking through AI and sort yeah. of tackling okay. it? Uh, um, so uh, I don't think I came necessarily at this work th uh, through bias. Um, I have, I mean, I've made a lot of work over the years that, uh, you know, deals with kind of general um, questions I had about what, um, what, Lakota, what Lakota philosophy is, how do I access it, how, how do I have access to knowledge, how do I make new knowledge, how do I learn knowledge, you know, those kinds of questions. And, um, and then uh, I have 
through composition, I became a interface maker, an interface developer, where I started making body interfaces because I was uh, frustrated with the tools that I had and I needed a new one. And I needed one that, um, the way I think about composition now is with computers is that when I compose, the computer is like um, a chain, a link in the chain um, that connects my composition where my body uh, moves or I hear, I like to start from hearing. I listen and I listen to sound and then the sound, maybe the sound's generated by the computer, maybe it's not. The sound then affects something visual and then, um, and then I react to that, I listen to that, I look at that and then there's a circular, and working in different circular patterns of circular composition. And so, um, uh, in order to do that process, in order to get my, in, I didn't necessarily need to use computational tools, but they seemed, uh, they seemed at the at that point uh, totally ready to do that kind of thing. So I started making, um, you know, basic Arduino things with um, inertial motion units, um, you know, the tilty things in your phone. It knows it knows where you're t moving, how you're moving, how fast you're moving. It also can know the temperature and you know the I don't know all sorts of um, little sensors are possible. And so I started making um, these body interfaces that included the computer in this conversation. But again, I was frustrated. And I thought that it was, I couldn't, I felt like I could never escape the one-to-one -one association. Like, I, I don't want to just be standing on stage, like, pressing a button by, like, banging my head back and forth. Like, that's not, um, that's how I felt that the um, inertial motion, I felt like I was just sliding, doing a slider um, uh, with, like, a giant slider on stage. <laughs> it's like not um, uh, not the detail level of detail that I wanted to push towards, and so um, I, I worked with a friend of mine, James Hurwitz, um, to make these interfaces uh, for a while. And so then, um, as of last year, when I started uh, after being at Concordia for a little while, um, I started to make a hair braid interface, which was the lo um, logic of well, if I'm going to make an interface, um, what's a Lakota interface? Do uh, do Lakota interfaces come on the arm? Are they, uh, where are they on the body? Um, how do I want to interact with the world? And I thought a logical thing was, was, ha was a hair braid. And so this is the hair braid that comes out of that. And what's um, different about this hair braid is that it, um, it includes, it's the same tools, same simple, um, you know, DIY Arduino IMU situation, except now trying to include um, more and more complex levels of machine learning um, into uh, the software and into the visual um, production, into the into the video um, that's on stage, and trying to complicate and make it more and more make it more difficult for myself, obviously. But um, uh, so this is at um, this is at uh, Ars Electronica last year, uh, and so in this piece, I'm interacting with the braid and talking at the same time, and very confused in a in a good way. And there's a projection in the background that is the result of the machine learning um, decisions. And so then, um, moving forward with that, uh, this is a this is a lot of braids <laughs> with a lot of sensors um, and a more complex machine learning um, situation. And this is made with my partner Devin Ronneberg, and it's up in Omaha right now. Um, and I think it will be uh, in Canada very soon, like next next couple months. Um, and in and so this one takes it even further and says, what's the, uh, let's see. So on this piece, um, there's a hub and it's like asking, I, we, we wanted to ask ourselves where, um, where does computation occur? Like where would an AI live? How do I build a home for an AI? Um, which is part of our, um, part of the essay that we're uh, collaborating on the, um, with the AI project. And, uh, it's just a nice picture of it. Um, mm -hmm. And how does one, how do I, how do I interact with it? How do I ask my audience and how do I touch braids? So like, even if, if they're not on my head, if, um, you know, do I need, so this is an example of a test for uh, um, conductive thread. Like, what's the word I'm looking for? Conductive thread designs. I'm done with Lakota uh, symbols, but in Lakota worldview, symbols uh, do things. Just like uh, that the, Mathematics in our computers are designed arrangements of numbers that uh, that do uh, things. They do real things, and so so do um, Lakota artworks and Lakota design. They have they have meaning. They go in and in and in and out and out and out. Um, and so for this process, this was this this process for this piece 
came out of the discussions that we had saying, if we want to make an AI in a good way, how do we do it in a good way? Is it possible? At this point, I don't know if it's possible to fully do it, um, but I'm committed to trying. And so for this piece, um, we asked my, we consulted with my cousin and my grandfather and my aunt and I don't know, whoever else chimed in and uh, asked how do we, how do we listen to this AI, or it's not even AI yet, it's just, it's just a computer that's got a little bit of machine learning on it, but um, how do we listen to it? And so he's like, oh, well, you sit down and, and, um, and write a song for it. Uh, and so we wrote this by trying, attempting to listen to it in a good way. And then, um, and then uh, we uh, had a blessing for the installation and, um, and thanked the, well, actually, Cor Corey Stover, my cousin, he apologized to the materials for um, the way they were taken from the ground. Um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. The next slides are from the okay. AI project. Uh, well, I wanted to ask, um, you, you referenced multiple times in that little synopsis, in a good way, making AI in a good way and doing things in a good way. Uh, what does that mean, a good way? Um, so a good way is, um, I think it's, uh, it's not a purely Lakota concept. There's, there's different ways of saying it and good way with capital G, capital W, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a it's a phrase that's a kind of a poor translation, but it, it basically means doing something in an ethical way, um, that is ethically oriented where your decision making is, um, tied to the whole community, um, where, uh, where there's a responsibility to others um, and to a and, and to larger larger entities than yourself, mm -hmm. and um, and there are translations for it all over. I feel like um, it's uh, it's the way the Lakota say that we're going to not uh, fail our kin. Okay. Yeah, that's one of the ways I think of it too. So Hawaiian Pono sort of captures some of that as well. It's like how do you how do you operate in a way that is going to be productive for your community, right? So not just yourself um, and not just some sort of external abstract thing, but for your community in general. Oh. And, it's, and it's related to ideas of protocol. So the, the reason why we call the workshops Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence is to, to sort of emphasize protocol as sort of a way of doing things that, um, that leads you or supports you in doing them in a good way or an opponent way, so that you conduct yourself and then the actions that you take are, again, sort of productive for your community as a whole and not just sort of focused on yourself or focused on something else. Interesting, so a framework for ethical action. Uh, and you mentioned an ethical action towards your kin, and uh, I w that was the next question I wanted to ask. Why kin? Why making kin with machines? So part of the... Part of my response when reading uh, Ido's essay, but also thinking about these larger conversation about bias and thinking about uh, how difficult it is to get technologists to get technologists to, to think kind of deeply about their their cultural relationship to technology. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that came up that was a product of the of conversations I was having with Suzanne. Um, the readings I was doing of people like Kim Talbert, who is sort of really interested in talking about how, how does kinship work in her community, she's Dakota, um, and how kinship is not just about kinship with humans, but it's kinship with non-human entities in the, um, uh, in the environment around them. In particular, she talks about pipe, uh, pipe stone and uh, that they use to do their carvings from and how it's treated very much as a member of that community. And the protocol that's used to excavate the pipe stone from the, uh, from the land and then to shape the pipe stone and then sort of use the products, the products of those. So really got me thinking about, okay, maybe part of what we need to do is, is think about, so there's lots of people for you know, decades now thinking about artificial intelligence or robots or something like that and thinking about how they kind of fit in relationship to the human. Um, whether they might have a soul, whether they're really going to be human-like, whether they're really intelligent, and whether they're really intelligent, like what kind of intelligence they have, and trying to figure out where these entities might fit in our understandings of how the world and how other entities are constructed, and thinking that one of the things that we might do is look towards indigenous epistemologies to think about how indigenous communities talk about non-human 
relationships. Um, because the languages there still retain a lot of richness and depth around that from whether it's a basic set of principles that then are used to guide your action, a basic sort of attitude towards the non-human that um, very much allows and expects that the non-human has something to say or has some volition or has some kind of um, presence in the world other than just as a tool or something to serve us. Um, and also as a way to sort of decenter um, the human as the, you know, the end all and the be all of why we take action and think about, okay, actually there's a bunch of other relationships that we have to attend to in order to live in a good way and to live in a way that's going to help all of us thrive. Thank you. Suzanne, do you have any comments my on? Pen, my, my pen stopped working. Why, um, <laughs> You know, I was, I'm trying to retain everything I was thinking while we were, while I was listening. Um, so one of the most productive, so I guess, um, one of the most productive conversations we had was when we were starting to think about kin and started to use the word kin, and then we had this like experience. It was with Scott and Adi and with Scott, and, uh, and uh, like arguing against the word kin for the word kin, like just really went in on it for uh, a really long, like hours and hours. And at the end, I was like, I was like upset. I didn't understand like why I needed, the, why I was interested in the word kin, or um, and why I also didn't like it at the same time because of its anthropological. Um, you know, we don't use, there's no translation, the kin isn't the right, tra and there's no right translation going from Lakota to English, but kin probably isn't it. Um, and the, uh, and, and then thinking about it further about what kinship means, and then now doing this process and saying, okay, well, how am I going to make, how am I going to make these relationships now that, now that I've written about it and talked about it at length, now what, what if I, how can I do it? Um, it occurred, you know, the, what has occurred is, first of all, in that initial conversation, um, why I felt, I felt a need, like I need this kinship with these non-humans. I need it. I cannot, um, I don't think I can survive without it. Um, and maybe kin isn't the right word or kinship isn't the right word, but I, but I need that relationship. Um, and I'm, and I refuse to give it up. And the, and then the other part that has come afterwards, um, in the pushback against maybe in my mind of using the word kin is that um, they we're not going to, we're not it's not in in, in a, it's different for all um, for the different cultures but I think in um, Lakota culture that the it's not like we make like we don't get married to our rocks um, we don't um, they would never stoop so low you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I always, I always, I always remind us that like this, I, mean, it's, I love this human, like putting like Anthropocene where, cause it doesn't really work for the L Lakota worldview because we are so dumb and stupid in comparison to bison. And then rocks are just like so much more intelligent than us that it just really, it's like, it, it's a joke to say that, you know? And then um, I was actually crack, cracking up because I was remembering, I was thinking about looking at the picture, Corey, and you're talking about um, the pipestone. And I remembered, um, my, my, my family is hilarious and they, uh, they were talking, we were talking about somebody, we were talking about somebody's marriage and, um, and he was like, he was like, those people, they got, they got married by the, they got married by the pipe, you know, with the pipe stone, pipe stone was involved in their marriage and he's like, that's so dumb, you know, they, um, instead of being married just for this life, they're going to be married for all of eternity. <laughs> <laughs> And, the, and so, and I was thinking about that because um, it, it points to something clear, which is that um, the pipe, uh, the pipe stone is an entity, and the pipe is an entity, and what happens um, is is the pipe can do powerful things, and the pipe stone does powerful things, and our relationship with those things is not. Um, we hear kinship, and kinship, I feel like, was used anthropologically to describe, like, you know, how I, how my mother's sister is also my mother, like fully my mother. Um, but it doesn't, I don't think it will ever do justice to our um, indigenous languages when we say kinship is like way, way more complex. So All right. don't get made by the pipe stone. Okay. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to, like, the ne next question I had is so the whole techno scientific project has been a project of abstracting human knowledge into algorithms. And as a software developer, that's my daily job is encoding bias, good and bad. So I'm wondering why the interest in focusing on AI specifically um, out of the whole techno-scientific project, like what is particular, uh, draws your interest? I mean, of course, we've talked about AI being actors and AI's involvement in your work, but from the crit critical angle, 
why focus on AI as that which is needing, uh, you know, new frameworks and, and new, new ways of approaching? <laughs> so a num number of different reasons. There's a, there's a sort of just kind of a current reason, which is that it's very much a topic of sort of both uh, sort of sort of scientific, technological, intellectual, and popular conversation. Uh, so the, the, there's a recognition that AI is a significant, uh, that sort of the kind of the, the recent advances in AI are a significant event in some way for how we organize ourselves as humans and what's happening to our societies. So there's that aspect of it. There's the aspect that, for me anyways, that, yeah, what I, something I mentioned earlier is like trying to get a handle on trying to get a handle on what this thing might be, because it's not, there's some ways it's not like tools that we've created before, right? So um, we really haven't created classes of tools that can sort of speak back to us in ways that feel very human-like, right? That can sort of simulate some parts of our emotional spectrum, right? That can um, sort of see patterns and connections that we can't see, right? Um, and then make them visible to us in ways where we're like, oh my God, okay, now I actually understand something significant about this topic that I wasn't able to understand that before, right? So, um, and it's not any one of these things I think that make it interesting. It's sort of all these things working together that make it um, sort of compelling to think about what what is this thing, right? And then there's sort of like kind of the far science fiction side of things, which I'm a, you know, I love reading science fiction, um, but you know, which is like, you know, when AI, uh, when the AI becomes conscious, right, um, and then sort of immediately, you know, becomes Skynet and kills us all, or you know, becomes a singularity yeah. and um, you know, and takes off Alpha Centauri because we're too boring for it, you know, those sort of like kind of really extreme things that you know we may never get to, and if we and if we do, it's going to be a very long time from now. But between now and then, this the capabilities of these systems are just going to become more and more powerful, and we're in the process of handing off more and more power to them. So that's a big reason why I think it's useful and necessary to talk about it now. Um, because as indigenous peoples, um, as, you know, as a brown person, um, you know, I sort of like historically sort of often been at the, at the pointy end of these kinds of technologies where these sorts of technologies are used against us in all sorts of different ways. And part of the way that they've been used against us is by devaluing us as humans. Right, as saying that we're not actually fully human in the way that you know the mainly sort of Western sort of males sort of define human, and trying to use AI as a way to think through what humanness is, not necessarily because I think AI is sort of on its way to becoming human, but it creates a really interesting mirror to think through that stuff, and then trying to think about okay, what kind of entity, what kind of AI entities do I want in my life? that are gonna help me and my communities thrive, as opposed to be the sort of thing where we're like, oh great, here's yet another tool that's gonna to be used to suppress us, to constrain us, um, and to once again claim that we're not full members of, of, um, of the human network. Right. Suzanne? Yeah. What drew you, why AI why overall, AI? the bias, the yeah. encoding that's going on all around? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Yes, I mean, the first of all, um, AI isn't special to me, and I don't care necessarily about AI. Um, uh, it's great that everyone else cares about it, I and mean, that's why I care about it. Um, <laughs> and I'll explain why. And yeah. it's that, uh, uh, to me, AI is an access to this, this, uh, this I don't understand, I, actually, I would like to know why that the, the Western view suddenly sees AI as, as anthropomorphizable. Is that even a word? Like, they see it as human-like or possible, maybe it's science fiction, maybe it's, like, I don't know what it is, and I don't, and I, I don't fully understand. That's great, because that's what we want, and that's what I want. I want us to look at um, objects and see them uh, as not objects, and not objectify, and not reduce, and not, um, uh, not blanket our ontologies on other beings. And so, um, so to me, it's about looking at um, what is AI and not seeing, not seeing this projection, the science, science fiction projection, first of all, and not seeing just a tool and not seeing a product um, to sell, 
uh, to uh, uh, like shareholders, but see raw materials that are uh, arranged in a way that works and does something. And, uh, and it's the raw materials that I am hyper-focused on because my interest is in why, um, why are bean, what makes a bean a bean or what makes me identify something as a bean? Um, the basic ontological questions of uh, the difference to me between Lakota and, and other worldviews. Um, you know, I didn't include it in the slide this time, but I like to include um, our re my uh, Reddit hater that posted about our paper, uh, Umami Tofu. <laughs> umami Tofu. Reddit user said that um, you know had a really it, it's, it's good because people don't uh, let, uh, people don't publicly push back um, uh, verbally sometimes so it's nice when someone clearly lays out in full anonymity that um, they hate the idea and why they hate it um, and they think it's stupid and they think that we're stupid uh, mostly me though because <laughs> Uh, in, in his response. And so what he said, he said that rocks don't have volition. Like how stupid could I be? Rocks don't have volition. And it's with that, um, and, and that, of course, lots of people have that opinion, um, have that viewpoint, that belief. But the, the thing is that um, if we cannot agree on that, that, um, that seemingly inanimate objects could have, um, have choice and have um, a history and a life uh, that's beyond just kind of this like geologic thing, um, this, uh, yeah, then that acts, that lays it all out um, and gives us the possibility to go all the way up through, like start from AI and go backwards and say raw materials are, um, are beans too, or go from the bottom and go, well, if my raw materials, which is why it's so easy to talk to my elders about this, talk to my grandfather, it's like no big, uh, oh yeah, yeah, computers, yeah, totally, and I understand, you know, easy, under easy understand, but it doesn't, it doesn't go the other way because there's not that, um, uh, that shared understanding. So from raw materials, I want to go maybe into abstract materials and talk more about protocol. You know, what is, so I work with protocol every day as a software engineer, um, and it defines exactly how I can work uh, and how I can interface with other systems. So I'm wondering, you know, what is the link between um, a cultural sense of a protocol and a computer science sense of a protocol? And why is protocol a good lens to think about AI through. Okay, I, hopefully I have my slides are, ah, yes, the protocol slides. Anyway, um, <laughs> I can barely read that far. Uh, so why is protocol? Um, the thing with protocol is that's just a word to say, that's a word for many things. Um, obviously that's not a Lakota word. Uh, in, actually, let me, I'll come back to this for all you phone, phone havers. I'll start here. Uh, so th this is from an, uh, taken from the essay uh, that I'm writing um, called How to Build Anything Ethically. And there are sections of that where I go piece by piece and say, this is the protocol for making um, X and this, is the and this is how we could translate that to making something AI related. So in this example, I worked through uh, the protocol, which basically means the ethical framework, um, the way you do something, um, how to do something in a good way, um, how to do something while respecting other things, and how do I do that in a sweat lodge with raw materials, how do I collect my raw materials, and then how do I translate that to, let's say, the physical computing device which holds or houses the AI, or in which you build the AI, et cetera. And starting from there, this, there's other examples in there. There's examples of um, uh, how a Hawaiian net can be equipped, um, how, how to connect that, the, process, the protocols of making the Hawaiian net to the protocols of uh, building a self-driving car AI that decides who, who to kill, drive off, and hit, you know, that, that now classic conundrum, um, uh, and how to, how to model that after um, how one could look at an ethical framework and do the same thing. So um, that's why protocols are a good thing, because they give you, they give you a, a way to know that you've done something in a good way. Because if you do all these things, you do it with a good heart, then um, it's it's probably gonna be okay. I think it can still go wrong, because, but, yeah. Do you, Life, yeah. Do you wanna talk a little bit about, for instance, so this is, you're basing this on Lakota sort of protocol, Lakota. right? Um, can you talk a little bit about, the, uh, because the protocol is based on, on, based on sort of certain precepts about what is good, 
right or yep. the good way to conduct yourself. Can you talk a little bit about those and about how the, the relationship? Yeah, sort of the relationship between uh, the seven values that you talked about, for instance, and yeah. sort of how you come to something like this. Yeah. So I, I hadn't actually. Th I mean, w one problem in talking in talking about philosophy um, and ethics and all of this and doing it in English and doing it. Um, in a way that makes sense and can be translated um, uh, is a is the problem that um, in the Lakota worldview there's not a there's there's not a, so much a separation of epistemology the way we know what how we know what we know with um, who gets to be a bean ontology and there's not a separation from ethics because they're all built in because when one thing relies upon the other um, the values um, are are easily generated and the thing is that um, you know, we talked about Google's, what, what are Google's values? And they, they tell you on their website uh, what their values are. And I think Amazon also has their, their values spelled out. Or Google calls them uh, what we know to be true. Very. <laughs> this is amazing. I don't know anything. Um, the, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the thing is, um, uh, Lakota, you know, values are, 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 uh, elders also give us our values, clear, clear values. We have seven sacred rights that we have to do during our lives. We have seven um, sacred values that are built in. And, and the thing is, when you do things in a good way, the values are built in. And, that, and that's kind of what we're saying, that if you do, if you're building AI in a good way, completely in a good way, then you won't have to worry that a, that a cyborg monster is going to come murder everyone because, we, because it's not built from the ground up with, um, you know, hellish uh, world-ending ontologies. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> Any other values you'd like to know? No, no, just <laughs> drop the mic. Just drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I think, yeah, I think highlighting how these things are all tied together and that part of the problem is, so if you go to, if you go to, is the, the Google, can you just go there real quick? Yeah. Uh, like, so these are, this is like the first page or the first half of Google's things that they know to be true, right? Which is sort of like basically kind of their ethical uh, ethical guidelines. And, you know, the thing is, is I don't, you know, for me, I read through this sort of thing at a corporate level and having been in Silicon Valley and I'm like, this doesn't matter at all, okay? It's not legally a a actionable. Right, so you can't actually go to court and say to Google and say, "Oh, Google did not follow, you know, number two, and so they should be held accountable for that." Right? Um, it's not even within the within the um, the corporate structure really um, a, a place of accountability because then, end of the day, at the corporate structure, everything reduces down to shareholder value, right? And so you, the arguments that get made about like what the corporation should do sort of hinge on that. They don't hinge on these sorts of things when it comes down to it. Right? There's lots of activity and talk and even action that happens at a higher level, which do you know, probably um, align with this and sort of make reference to this. But when it really comes down to it, when the money's on the line or maybe potential jail time is on the line, these mean nothing at all. And so that's part of the, part of the reason why I wanted you to talk about the underlying sort of values behind your proposals about how to make, thing, how to make anything ethically is that it's necessary to actually ground those values in a way that's, that is meaningful and has consequences within the community. So within the community, right, if you're not living in that way, that's gonna have consequences for your relationships in the community, right? And uh, so I think it's important, and if you go to look at any of them, Amazon, Facebook, any of them, it's all this kind of fluff that they've put on there, and only kind of recently in certain ways, you know, because they've been pushed on a number of different levels to sort of think about this and sort of talk about this sort of thing, right? And then you have these sorts of things like, you know, AI applications we will not pursue, which is really meaningless because there's all these sort of weasel words that they use, right? So international law. Yeah. So technologies that gather, we won't use technologies that gather or use information for civilians violating internationally accepted norms, which means nothing, right? When you have a huge range of governments around the world, you know, conducting different levels of surveillance, they could reasonably argue like, well, this is an accepted norm within our, within our uh, culture or within our nation. And, um, uh, so figuring out how to tie these things together, I think, is one of the biggest the biggest challenges. Great. Uh, well, we're getting close to the Q and A time. Uh, going fast, we have a lot to discuss. Uh, so 
thinking now maybe we could go hone in on you know what is uh, what is an ethical framework we like specifically if there's examples that came through your work uh, in the workshops and sort of make these concepts tangible on how an indigenous uh, ethical framework could impact the, 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 the trajectory of AI. Yeah, actually, so I'm gonna zoom in on, the, on what I've been working on and, and saying how, you know, trying to imagine with, with many people are involved in, in, this, in this writing project and many people have been involved um, what do we have, almost 40 people at the first, you know, um, uh, workshop. And so trying to think, uh, what is AI made of? Um, and and what are the, how do we apply frame, an ethical framework um, and protocols into building it? So in this, um, this first iteration, um, uh, we, I'm looking at AI as a series of streams of protocol, uh, data collection, the physical computing, vi computing vice device itself, uh, the compensation method for mater all materials involved, raw material in this case being data and um, physical raw materials, uh, distribution of these tools, use of these tools, software design, uh, the coding language, and uh, governance and oversight for this process and the use and all these process processes. And then to break down one of these streams further, uh, these are all the um, steps that I'm imagining at the moment. Um, that uh, basically, these are pulled precisely from conversations with my family members, um, with elders, and saying, well, how exactly do we build a sweat lodge in a good way? And then identifying um, what, the, what the general gist of each step is. And so uh, these steps are consultation, identifying stakeholders, so instead of using shareholders, I say stake, who has a stake in this? So even the water can have a stake in the process of mining something. Um, uh, need, why do we need it? Do we need it? Um, uh, raw materials, collecting them, uh, compensation, uh, building a base, um, building like the, the groundwork for something, uh, to me the ontological groundwork, but maybe it's just the, 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 the code base. Yeah. The, um, Preparing internal components, um, construction, running the program, uh, which also needs to be done in a good way, transformation, um, which is very important to me, uh, welcoming, welcoming the whatever you've made in, into the community, into a larger community, not just with like a shareholder, you know, presentation, um, and uh, running the programs, running the machine, running, um, uh, running the process of getting the materials and, and death cycle. And death cycle is one of the most important parts of building anything, it says what is gonna happen at the end of its life. And there are some really good examples in indigenous communities already of how you, you know, um, recycle something. We can't even recycle, we can't recycle even a fraction of the technologies that we're making at this point. And um, so for example, uh, the, the Hawaiian net, um, when you build a net, when you're done with it, you don't just throw it away. Why would you throw away perfectly good fibers? Um, uh, these fibers were part of your family. They helped you get food. They helped you um, make relationships with other, with new kin, uh, with new communities. And yeah, so. Yeah. What's transformation? What's transformation? So we were talking about this uh, outside, and I think um, just now I'm trying to remember what I said. So in in the in the Lakota language, the the word wakam means. Um, I thought it meant sacred. It means many things. I wrote about it in the Making Kin with Machines article. Um, in one perspective of Wakam, um, uh, and, but to me, Wakam also means transformation. So something isn't sacred just because we say it is. Something is um, usually sacred because it, there's, a trans, there's a transition that happens. Like humans are sacred, hu human beings are sacred because uh, we transition from one place into this human realm and then we, trans and we transition out of it. And the transformation is the amazing part. You know, um, uh, wood turning into ash um, on the fire, the rock turning water into steam during the sweat lodge, that is the sacred part. Um, the possibility for transformation um, um, is the amazing part. And so then in the transformation of maybe just a mere machine into a community member maybe in the future, or a transition from a mere machine or raw materials, arranging them in a design, that that does something else that makes a computer. It, it true. It's a, that's the transformation that um, that has the potential to be sacred. Okay. Great. Thanks.
Jason, Go anything? Or open the, the yep. floor for questions, if anyone has any. If not, yep. Do we have a mic? Or? Oh. oh, yeah, we've got the mic there. OK, great. right here. I thought this was going to be my Oprah moment, but. <laughs> <laughs> and while we're, while we're doing the Q&A, we're going to uh, just show some, uh, some uh, paintings that were made during the first Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence um, uh, workshop in Hawaii by an artist who was there sort of recording the events for us. So. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm going to just try to <clears throat> think out loud. There's so much to link. Um, I'm just wondering um, if for all makers, basically, for, for all artists and makers in general, um, if we are thinking about, if we are shifting um, from, you know, a power dynamic uh, of author, creator, um, you know, our, our power relationship with, <clears throat> our power dynamic between us and our creation is, is, you know, creator and creation to something that is anchored in listening to the form with which we are collaborating. Um, uh, and allowing, therefore, more of, a, of, an, uh, of an emergence of an aesthetic rather than something that we envision and that we are kind of imposing on the form that we're working with. I'm just thinking of, um, uh, of, of these things while, while you're speaking and, and finally, like with the idea of transformation, that, that these forms that we're working with are actually you know, it's not just an emergent aesthetic, it's also the forms themselves are, are changing, they're, they're emergent as well, as, as, we, as we are as well. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm thinking of all of these things and I'm, I'm going back to specifically the, the work that you've done as artists. How, how, do, how, did, that, how did that um, work um, with, you know, looking at the, the uh, kite, if, if we're looking at the, the um, the braids and their, you know, the, and their extension to the electronic form, that that sort of transformation, that and and their extension from your own hair as well. So I'm I'm just thinking of um, how how did, how did that work specifically with that work? Thank you. Sorry for the very long question. Um, I guess I honed in on a couple of things that you said, especially I think you would use the word listening, um, like listening to what you've made. And I, and listening is, is the core of my training as an artist, the core of the, of the ethics, um, which I have been trying to learn. Um, and that, and that listening, that emergence, um, of properties, I know that's a, I mean, it feels really good when your machine learning thing does something that you did not expect and it feels magical. And, um, but that is just the first step and, and it's it's for and to me it's almost forcing objects to to listen to them on you, to be listened to on your terms um, because the only way which is what's interesting to me about the Western engagement with AI machine learning computers is is that we had to write a new language in order to communicate with rocks and I think that's really awesome that the language has been written languages many languages um, get written every day for computer science um, but. Uh, you know, I guess what my grandfather would say is that uh, you can listen at any time to anything, and it's a choice, and that choice is the ethic, ethical choice. And you know, um, when I think about the word Bokan, it, it not only does it mean transformation, but it means that which cannot be under cannot be understood, it cannot can never be understood. So to desire to listen to something and to hear immediately is n is um, is is foolish. It's just it's not going to happen. That's not the way. That's not the way it works. That's not the way this this type of listening works. And so through the artworks, I'm able to to work through my desperation to hear something, to force it to make music for me. And you know, you know I feel it's it's something to to work through. You know, I made the braids and I interact with them, and um, and I the audience gets to interact, and I get to ask myself like, does the does this object, the the, the discrete minerals and metals in this computer, want to actually say these things? And you know, that's kind of where I'm at with that sculpture at the moment. Um, but also, I, I mean, specifically, it's contextual. And that the, the context of that braid piece is a Lakota context. I'm thinking about it through Lakota protocols, with Lakota frameworks. Uh, near, it's in, uh, I know, um, 
it's not, uh, Omaha isn't on Lakota land, um, but it's nearby, um, and yeah. So for me, I haven't actually made any artwork that pulls on AI, um, but I, the working with some of the artists that are, you know, talking with some of the artists that are working with us in addition to uh, Suzanne, but uh, so Scott Bennis and Abandon, who's an Anishinaabe artist, um, and then uh, uh, Michelle Brown, who you can see the last two slides in the cycle, the uh, Chi Chardon sort of idea coming from, pulling from her Basque sort of background. What I see is um, this, it, it, it creates, it sort of created an impetus or encouraged an impetus that maybe was already there to really think through how the, um, how the technology can be used in a very localized way. Right, so how can the technology be used to address uh, the needs of a particular community and express um, express sort of what the, those values, but also do work for the community that the community thinks is, is is necessary or desirable? And this goes back to the question much earlier about abstraction. So one of the things that we've talked about a lot in this group of people, right, is that in sort of computer science, certainly within artificial intelligence, you know, and lots of sort of science and technology work, right? There's this real drive towards abstraction because there's a power that comes in abstraction. Um, and so the idea is like, you know, how do you create an AI system that can survey anybody, right? Because that's where the money is, right? And that's where the power is. And what we're finding, what we're seeing again and again about surveillance is that's been a huge problem, right? Because there's all these assumptions built into what anybody is, how anybody looks, right, and how they behave. And so we're finding all sorts of racial bias embedded in those systems. And it's be part of it is because of this abstraction that happens, um, that, that first of all, that abstraction is seen as a great good. And second of all, that abstraction is done very lazily, right? And so whole sorts of um, kind of very localized and particular ways of being in the world are completely stomped and sort of like glossed over when you do that. And so part of what's interesting to me both about this project here and the project that Scott's been working on um, is how they're sort of using their cultural grounding to think about how this AI technology can be used to really sort of address what is important in that local context instead of being like, oh, we're gonna make something that can, you know, can cover 10 million people, right? Thank you. Another question? Yeah, um, so thinking about biases that are invisible and visible, and also thinking about um, like computer science methodologies that are visible and invisible, so thinking about making like um, a remote server call where you don't see the physical result of, or, or the physical materials that are being used to do that work. I was wondering what the kind of like need or, um, yeah, kind of like the need for physicality or embodiment of AI or of digital materials, digital work, and how that relates to us being able to identify with and, and see that being done. Um, what, about the, what about the need? So what's, what's necessary about it? The, I think that um, the next, I think hopefully the next revolution in tech is, um, is uh, clarity of what's actually happening um, for everybody and for and especially for the people making things because the people when you make something you feel like you're the expert in it but uh, you don't actually know where your servers are and you don't know who runs them and you don't know what power grid they're running on what's what um, energy source how they're polluting how they're not you, we don't really know and and there's some there's there's more and more tools now there's some there's some vague descriptors by uh, by lar these large companies um, that say where things come from, but it's not um, it's not good enough. And same same thing, we need um, genealogy of our data. We need to know where all the data comes from, where it is going to. And um, you know, uh, yesterday I was thinking about Kate Crawford's uh, uh, gigantic um, vis anatomy of AI visualization. And and you remember that if you see look on the side on the left side of that page. At the very bottom, you know, the CEO makes the most money, the company um, shareholders, and then at the very bottom, um, right below the miners who mine the materials for these giant servers, right underneath them are the data providers, the users who provide their data for free. And, um, you know, there's some really amazing compensation because when you have clarity of, of the genealogy of your data and the genealogy of your objects and your raw materials, then you can ask for fair compensation. 
And uh, there's some really amazing work in, in this uh, forthcoming essay by Ashley um, Kords, who will, who, um, who's Umatia, and she will, you know, um, talk about compensation methods with uh, blockchain. And, uh, and then another way of looking at it, it's, um, and there's, you know, lots of people doing critiques on this, right? There's the, the way these systems are already developed, particularly the machine learning systems are being developed, right, is that they're, they're black boxes to the people who made them, right? So they you know, so they run them and it, they get a result and they can't actually do the genealogy of that result, right? Because what's actually happening inside of the machine learning, particularly with adversarial learning, right, is not actually sort of human readable. And, um, and that's, I mean, it's, to me it's amazing how blithely this practice is being sort of like has been taken up and been encouraged and it's like wow kind of what you know what sort of engineering practice do we have where we're like okay we're going to build this thing over here that people's lives might depend on but we don't really understand how it works we just know that every time we've run it it's given us the results that we want right that's a really dangerous path to go on i think and other people critique that as well and so i think that's also an issue about visibility and being able to trace back how we get to a point um, before we continue to hand over more and more power to these systems. Right, so as I like to say, black boxes all the way down. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as the antithesis to what we were discussing till now, knowing exactly where your rocks come from, right? So um, I think we have time for another question. If there's anyone, oh, hi. hi. Yeah, um, thank you so much for this. It's been a really big joy. Um, I, uh, you know, some of the questions that come up around discourse around AI on multiple levels is like, and I've even heard it here, is the question of whether or not AI is intelligent or is creative. And um, what I really appreciate about the, you know, invocation of uh, Lakota ontologies of being especially is that, um, you know, th those are inherent answers of, of a yes. Um, what I'm interested, and I think that it's been addressed throughout your guys' talk, um, is the context of artificiality, right? And, and the idea of whether or not, not if AI is intelligent or creative or anything like that, but whether or not it is artificial at all and, and what the um, contextualization of it as artificial intelligence does for um, our capacities to engage in these, um, you know, um, indigenous protocols and, and to really like counteract that exact like um, you know Western contextualization of um, separation between maybe technological and natural and and this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean a big thought. I think a big part of the work is to address exactly that, right? So going back to what Suzanne has been saying about the raw materials and other people talked about in our group about sort of going back to where these things come from is they they come from our you know natural world right they're all products we're all products of the natural world and and erecting this barrier making this really trying to make this really clear distinction between sort of what is real and what is artificial in this sense is highly problematic and it's a and it's a byproduct of this sort of holding up the human as as sort of kind of distinct and separate and above sort of the rest of creation to use the christian speak that it all comes from um, and that sort of by kind of terming it as artificial, um, it sort of allows us to sort of s to distance ourselves from it, to sort of really see it as a tool, right? That we don't have to think about the way in which it's composed of lots of different natural things, right? The, the raw material, but also the, the product of human effort, right? And human conscious will and design. Um, and the, the, the artificial intelligence thing together, I think is, is part of what allows, allows sort of uh, developers to sort of do, kind of do this crazy handing off of sort of responsibility to it. It's like, oh, well, it's intelligence, right? So we can give it this kind of responsibility, you know? And, uh, and you know, that's a problematic, problematic way to look at it. Yeah, I guess I'll just, um, just say that the, that there are, I mean, what you said is spot on. The There is context, every con contextual ethics are possible everywhere. Every single place on this planet and probably on other planets, all over, wherever, we, wherever you go, there is contextual e ethics that are possible because everywhere is a location that has a framework that can be found. 
And um, even if um, some of our people have been genocided out of existence, no matter where you go in the world, there's people who are gone now and their ethics and their contextualist ethics are gone. There's still so many places to find it. And um, even the places that we mine our raw materials from, they have contextualist ethics too. They have, a, they have um, protocols uh, for, uh, for that location. And, um, and I think through that, it's possible to, to, generate, to generate from there. And um, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Okay, I think that we're very close to the end of time. Oh, one more question? One more yes. question back there in Hello. the darkness? Hi, great, um, last question. Kind of in mind with um, like a global community of technology and creation, um, with the goal of digital transparency, what kind of international or interdisciplinary um, jurisdiction or um, standards can allow us to obtain uh, ethical standards within AI creation? That is a good question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's interesting, right? There's, there's things like the, you know, the Montreal Declaration on uh, AI rights and responsibility. There's a Toronto Declaration. The EU has a declaration, right? So over the last five years, you've seen various entities um, starting from like the corporate level or not starting, but including the corporate level to sort of kind of the, I don't know what you would call the Montreal one, municipal level, that doesn't really make sense. I'm not really sure how you would try to kind of contextualize that uh, to things like the EU, which actually sort of taken an official stance as a, as a governing body, try to both articulate what the ethical approach should be, um, uh, but then kind of fail when it comes to specifying or sort of even kind of really deeply envisioning how those ethical guidelines might be enforced, right? Or even how they might necessarily be encouraged, right? And so, uh, so for me, it's not clear to me, particularly at the international level, how you do that sort of thing. And so part of what, part of what we are doing that's come up again and again is like really focusing on local, localized contextual levels, which, you know, are not gonna solve everything by any means. And, um, are not gonna address the fact that there are lots of other players in this sort of area that don't give a, don't give a rat's ass for, for the local context, right? And so what do we do about them? And I'm, to be really honest, at this point, I'm really not sure. I mean, so part of what we're doing, part of the outcome of all this work is that we're aiming towards January now, is that we'll produce um, sort of a, a position paper out of the Indigenous Protocol and Artificial Intelligence Workshop discussions that sort of articulates how we think these sorts of things should be approached, um, both in the sort of the policy way, but then also in the artistic way, and then also like in terms of uh, actually developing some technology that embodies the ideals that we're thinking about to use again as sort of just guideposts. How you enforce it, really, really, really tricky question. I think, you know, I think that uh, regulation is necessary and must be demanded by users, must be demanded by um, by people who are affected, because um, you know, one of the reasons that, that it's important for indigenous people to work on, in AI and on AI um, is because it's going to, it already affects us and it will affect us because when you are disproportionately oppressed, um, you'll be oppressed by whatever tool comes out next. And um, the, it, so it's necessary, but, the, but the, we have, there's some problems. I mean, while Canada does have some new regulations, um, that, that work towards this, some uh, national regulations. We know that international law means nothing to the superpower countries. UN Declaration on um, Indigenous Rights means nothing to, to anybody, apparently. The, you know, the, um, so it's, uh, it's a steep fight, but it must be done because, there's, because the planet's going to not be here um, for us to not, not be okay for us anymore if, uh, if we don't get on top of these things. Um, especially on top of the raw materials and recycling and so forth. Well, thank you, Jason and Suzanne. I look forward to watching this work deepen and broaden over the coming uh, future. So thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Everyone. <laughs>